somebody near you, next to you, doesn't matter if you know them or, or don't know them. And what I want you to do is to draw a picture of that person, but here's the catch. Um, you, are, you are going to be drawing, a, within one minute, a picture of each other without looking at the paper, only looking at each other. Let me see your one minute masterpieces, drawing from each other, and then one minute only look down. Satisfaction. So when I talk about happiness, that's, that's what I'm talking about this evening. Um, I run Action for Happiness, but rather than talking about this initiative we've been building up, I've been asked to talk about kind of my personal journey, what on earth has led me to doing this job. Uh, and, and I'm going to talk about three things that have been quite transformational for me in that process of getting to what I do now, because I think they're interesting, and also because now, having had the pleasure to work with some of the leading um, psychologists, neuroscientists, experts on well-being. These are also things that I now realise are very much backed up by science and are probably true for lots of us. Um, so my story is I was a corporate guy. I, um, having left university and, 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 and PhD and so on, I, I went and started working in consultancy. I spent about a decade working as a management consultant doing kind of what this chap is doing here. And that isn't me. I haven't just gained hair randomly. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and I was basically chasing up a ladder. I got into it pretty much excited by the idea of helping companies and people solve problems. I was creative, I was into um, big challenges, but basically got a little bit hooked on this chasing up a ladder. It was a ladder of promotion, of uh, more responsibility, to be honest, of pay as well. And after that best part of a decade and very much along the way, I realised that was deeply unfulfilling and actually not what I wanted to be doing in my life. And what really triggered that was an incidence of um, pain. And this very much links back to, I think, the first story we heard this evening. Um, I started getting pain in my back. Um, initially, it was nothing out of the ordinary. But after two years of not really being able to walk properly, some days literally being stuck in bed all day, um, I had 
a bit like our first speaker, been to see lots of ologists and different specialists, and hadn't really got any conventionally, well, an understanding of why this was. In fact, I was told I had a hereditary degenerative spinal condition. I was told I had a slip disc, uh, sort of spinal ab abnormalities. And one day my wife, sort of in despair, gave me a book called Mind Over Back Pain. And I'm a kind of a, a rational, scientific kind of guy. My, my background was in engineering. I looked at it and went, to be honest, darling, this looks like complete nonsense. Um, but what I learned from reading that was something that's been transformational for me and I think is very true for many of us, which is actually most pain, in this case my, my pain in my back was triggered by muscle tension, most muscle tension comes from stress. Stress was not something I would be able to let out because of my nature, I was very much keeping a bottle in it, it was crippling me, I was um, deeply unhappy, but it was showing itself physically rather than in terms of my personality. Um, and this is my first kind of point here, which is our physical health has a massive impact on our happiness, our overall well-being, our, our life. Um, this isn't just what I found, actually, now there's an amazing body of research showing that people that have better psychological health, that are happier, not only are more resistant to illness, they're less likely to catch colds, quite interesting this time of year, um, they also live longer. So there's a remarkable amount of very vigorous scientific evidence to back up the fact that we are, are, you know, this idea that is, it's all in our mind, that the first speaker mentioned, I mean, it genuinely was all in my mind, but that was very real physically, and we often lose sight of that link. So I moved on, and this is sort of proof that I recovered, and because um, I did start um, from this process a little bit of meditation, a little bit of activities to calm me down, and that left, led me actually within weeks to be running again, to be doing sport. This is with some colleagues and friends doing a, a 10k run, not that much long after I'd been pretty much incapacitated. <coughs> but the reason I'm actually showing this photo is sort of when my journey moved on, I, I started pursuing other interests, and I got really into the idea of sustainability and some of our big challenges around climate change and uh, other issues and joined an organisation called the Carbon Trust and this is a group of us here but the reason I'm showing this photo is actually because of the girl who's just behind me there in the red top, Sophia, um, who was um, someone I recruited into the company but she was the admin assistant to our department. She had a job that basically in most people's eyes in that organisation was trivial. It was sort of you know turning handles, it wasn't an important job, she had no line responsibility, no real influence and yet she taught me a, an incredibly powerful lesson in that she transformed our organisation. Um, she, she had two things, she had positivity and people glue as I call it. She was someone that connected people together, she made everybody feel welcome, she had time for everybody, she was kind, she, she cared, she, you know, she didn't have any necessarily particular knowledge of what we were doing as an organisation, but she transformed how people felt and how people were and really helped me see that Something we now know again from the evidence that our mood and our emotion, our happiness, and equally our, our misery is quite contagious. Um, so how we treat each other really matters. We now know that actually it goes through three degrees of separation. My mood, my happiness affects my friend's friend's friend. We've got rigorous evidence showing that. So really actually how we treat each other matters so much more than we often remember in terms of the ripple effects that we have on, on those around us. Um, but I was still struck, even doing this job, that I found much more fulfilling than my corporate background, that I had not yet found my purpose. And I stumbled on a, a framework which I found really helpful for me, um, designed to help us find our purpose, this idea that we all uniquely have something that we are um, best placed to do. And this is from someone called Neil Crofts. And he talks about if you can find something that combines your talent with your passion to address the things that make you angry, then you found your purpose. And I, I was really taken with this idea, so I, I did it for myself, and I, through a, a fairly you know, prolonged process, realised that my kind of skills I'd learned with managing things, with people, were useful. Um, they were some of my talent. My passion was this idea of what are the things that increase that really make us happy? Less about what we earn and what we own, much more about our relationships, our, our kind of self-awareness. And um, my anger was really this idea that we've got a society with its priorities all wrong. That was very true in the climate change issues I was looking at. But actually the whole of our consumer society is in danger of prioritising the wrong things. So this led me to try and define my life's purpose as to use my management of people skills to help society become more authentically happy and, in brackets, as a result, more sustainable, moving away from um, you know, buying stuff as the route to fulfilment. Um, and I didn't really, you know, I thought that's nice, lovely, but in the statement, um, wasn't really sure where that was going to take me and was then blown away a few months later to open the newspaper and find that a role advertised leading a, a, a movement in its early stages thinking about 
happiness and well-being. So, of course, having written that life's purpose made it very easy for me to say, I have to do that, whatever, come, come what may. And um, I'm now in this remarkably privileged position of running this initiative called Action for Happiness. Um, we're basically a movement of people who believe that, that happiness really matters, that actually as a society, growing our overall well-being is much more important than growing our, our wealth. Um, and we have about 20,000 people from very different backgrounds who are all doing something to contribute to building a happier society. That could mean the way they are as parents with their kids, the way they treat their colleagues at work, the way they are on their street with their neighbours, um, you know, the way they choose to contribute. But crucially, it's not just about my happiness, it's about how do we contribute to something better for all of us. And, and I can't really say how much this has transformed me, the privilege of doing this job, because in doing something that I feel like I've found my purpose and my meaning has brought an enormous sense of fulfilment to me mainly because I think I've realised that actually perhaps the most consistent way to find happiness is to care deeply about other people's happiness. That's what, for me, is what my meaning and purpose has become. So I guess my final point is learning that a life with meaning and purpose is really where true fulfilment lies. Everyone's definition of that is different, but I would urge you all to think about much more about what we can contribute to others as much as what we can get for ourselves. So my final question then is, um, what are you doing to make the world a happier place? What are you doing to contribute to, um, to the happiness of others? And, and in so doing, of course, boosting your own well-being and, and fulfilment. Thanks very much for listening.